Okay, we're, uh, I think we're on live now. So uh, uh, hello, I want to say hello to whoever is uh, joining our session out there from the Harasses Global Meeting 2021. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, uh, my name is John Cook. I'm based in Zurich. I'm the moderator for the session, this, this session on collaboration. Um, I want to just give kick off with a couple of uh, quick intros, uh, and then we're going to launch into the discussions that my friends and I have been having here for the last uh, last two or three weeks. We've actually spent several hours talking to each other and getting to getting uh, to know each other and um, uh, and exchanging ideas for this most interesting session. Uh, so I come from the U.S., Chicago, Milwaukee area, the Midwest. I spent the first 30 years in the U.S. In the last 40 years here in Europe, in London, Brussels, Frankfurt, and Zurich, um, I have spent time with Merrill Lynch, International Harvester, um, Bank of America, Security Pacific, and Merchant Banking Asset Management roles. And of late, the last 20 years, I've been in the private equity business, mostly raising capital for various fund managers in various jurisdictions, venture capital uh, pro programs. I've uh, launched a, um, uh, an accelerator in India, and that was a very interesting experience and has given me a lot of exposure to lots of different countries and, and people. Um, I want to start off before we get into introductions with the purpose of this session, and it's 45 minutes only, so we're going to move along rather quickly so we can hear the input from our, our panel. But uh, the collaboration, collaboration is our superpower is the title that Frank has given us. Uh, I just want to read briefly. He says that COVID-19 has tested our ability to work together and the results have been rather disappointing as we only witnessed a, a, a mixed patchwork of achievements so far. Looking to the future, challenges like the pandemic and climate change simply cannot be solved by a single nation or any group going it alone. How can we better collaborate on the world's most pressing issues? Where are the pitfalls in this? And uh, now, great, I see that Chris has been able to join us. So this panel is not about COVID particularly or about politics or war or climate change as topics as important as they are. It's rather to consider and, uh, and uh, create ideas on how exactly we can better collaborate. So with my self-introduction done and the setting the, the tone for the for the panel, I'd like to ask Katharina uh, Van Delden, could you introduce yourself quickly and uh, in just a minute and, and give us a snapshot of what you're doing currently in your work? Of course, uh, thanks for the amazing introduction. I think this is really such a great panel and uh, such a relevant topic and really plays along what interests me. I'm Katharina van Delden, I'm the founder and CEO of the software company InnoSabi. And um, we develop software for innovation management processes of larger organizations. And the basic underlying observation is that innovation today and now more than ever really doesn't, um, is not created anymore behind closed doors and lots of NDAs and secrecy, but really innovation today has to be developed in collaboration in networks and ecosystems. And Inosabi provides the software to do exactly that, to, as an organization, work together with customers, with clients, with suppliers, startups, universities, you name it, to accelerate innovation processes. And this is the viewpoint I want to bring today to this discussion, is really how to foster innovation um, through collaboration. That's fantastic. James, can I ask you to go next? As a medical doctor and an entrepreneur, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Share a bit of what you're doing currently. Yeah, um, I'm a, I grew up in New York City. Um, I was a good boy. Uh, went to Harvard and Cornell, became an internist and a surgeon, um, and then decided that um, doing one operation at a time wouldn't have much impact on the world. And I've been a Basically, for the last 40 years, a uh, what would be described today as an impact investor of my own time and money as an entrepreneur, um, developing programs that have had a major impact. I, I founded the company in America that uh, started the, the wellness health promotion movement. Um, I built what became the largest bioinformatics software company in the world. It was used, software was used to help sequence the human genome. 
Uh, and I'm currently now developing a, a product which is going to impact about 5 billion people in the world. It's a portable surgical instrument sterilizer that uses no heat, electricity, or water. Um, and what I've taken from all of those experiences is that it's impossible in this world to do anything significant by yourself. And if you don't collaborate with people, um, you're going to be dead in the water. And that's basically my stance. And I would say the other stance that I would point out is that when we use the word collaboration, uh, we either think about it as the way we're doing on this conference this morning, five people talking to each other, individual collaboration. And then we talk about the larger, um, more difficult exercise of uh, international collaboration. They're two entirely different things. Um, um, and there's not much that Dr. Bernstein is going to do to get uh, China and the United States and India um, and sub-Saharan Africa to collaborate. Um, but I can lead by example, which is the way I uh, organize my life. Very interesting. I know in our prior calls, the last three weeks, we've talked about, you know, our sort of our personal impact and where we are in the collaboration spectrum. And you've said one of your key drivers is how to magnify our efforts. So you've really uh, per taken that to heart, it gone from surgery to, um, you know, to, to a much bigger impact. So that's, that's fantastic. Chris Parsons, chair of the India practice at Herbert Smith Freehills. Could you uh, give your brief background bio and what you're doing currently and, and some comments on collaboration to kick off? Yeah, sure, John. I mean, you, 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 you've given my bio, really. I'm a, I'm a lawyer with an international law firm called Herbert Smith Freehills, and I uh, clearly haven't shown much imagination because I've been there all of my career, which is now 36 years. And um, I've been based around the world, but for the last uh, 16 years, I have been focused on India as chairman of our India practice. And... Um, uh, Foreign lawyers are not allowed to have a, an office in India, um, but we are allowed to fly in and fly out when we don't have COVID restrictions. And um, uh, so I, I've not been in India for, for the last uh, year and a half, and I'm missing it enormously. Um, and, uh, and, and my specialist topic, apart from being a lawyer and India, is on mental well-being, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, John. But thank you. Okay, fantastic. Thanks a lot. Um, great to have you here. And uh, Mark, can Mark Hollingsworth, can you uh, introduce yourself and your background? It's in nutrition, but can you tell a bit about what you're doing and how you got there? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, John. Yes, Mark Hollingsworth. I'm the CEO of the Nutrition Society, which is a, a scientific learned society based in London, um, but with a, a, an international membership of nutritionists, researchers, academics, industry. Uh, now in 85 countries uh, around the world. And my background, though, is not in science or nutrition. Um, my background is in the British Royal Air Force um, as a military officer. And then when I retired after 16 years, um, I joined the, uh, the non-profit world, if I can call it that, um, which brought me to this role uh, seven years ago. Um, and shortly after that, uh, we developed a strategy here at the Nutrition Society. Um, one of the objectives um, that we were looking at was to, to, to find special projects that um, had the potential for global impact uh, in nutritional health. Um, and I was looking for a part to play in that. Um, obviously, the scientists have their piece to play. Healthcare has its piece to play. And, and stumbled quite by accident on a on a trip to africa uh, to visit i think the um uh, might have been in kenya I, I lose track of so many places like others who travel a lot um and i stumbled across governance um and and the need for ethical values-based leadership based around people's character and if you can collaborate one-to-one -one and start to build sustainable networks in the leadership of organizations, then the function of that organization um, has great potential. So I've spent probably the last four or five years slowly building this global network of people who share that approach of ethics and values um, and, um, and helping other societies around the world uh, uh, develop a stronger base to operate from. Uh, fascinating journey. I'm sure will never end. But so, so my approach really is that is you, 
as individuals, we have a role to play in leadership because you don't lead buildings and organizations, you lead people. And it's the people piece that particularly interests me. Um, individual sustainable relationships is where it all starts. Thank you. Interesting. Thanks, Mark. Well, yeah, people is the whole the whole equation because we have people populate the planet, people affect each other, people procreate, uh, people make mistakes, people fail to collaborate, and uh, and we have all these problems which we probably don't need to have if we have better leadership uh, in the world. So, um, looking forward to hearing more of your thoughts, Catherine. You're all about innovation and uh, collaboration, and what do you find is the most you know so. Innovation has been the solution for a lot of the problems we've had, even even more. Wars have been 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 uh, ended by by innovation and and uh, starvation in, in in places in the world and agriculture. Innovation has really been driving a driving force to solving problems. But in terms of uh, getting the innovation message out to a, a world that doesn't really isn't really designed for collaboration, how do you bridge from this side of the river to that side of the river on the innovation on the innovation spectrum and get people to collaborate in your in your job in your work in your life? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, actually, I like that you take. A larger perspective on the definition of innovation, you know, because if you come from um, from the business world, very very often look at innovations as new products and services. But in reality, um, I personally believe that innovation is what has been driving us as humanity for always, <laughs> already, you know, to really to strive to improve, to find solutions to problems. And if you look on where we are today, it's really. Um, uh, the whole development of how we live and how we live together really is based on, on constant invention and innovation. And there is one definition I do have to look up who said it, but which I really like is that innovation is the justified hope for a better future. And I think this is really, really um, what uh, describes best what we see as kind of the significance of innovation. And, um, this is really why I believe in order to um, to include people in innovation processes, um, <clears throat> the most important part to get them to engage and to um, to collaborate really is a, a joint purpose, uh, a common purpose um, and a common goal. And for that, we don't even have to kind of brand the whole effort in innovation process. You know, that's... A kind of secondary, <laughs> but really uh, it's about bringing people together to solve larger problems and to um, evoke in them the spirit that, you know, if they have a larger purpose together, uh, it's worth it to, um, to, to bring in your skills, to bring in what you know and your resources to, to help solve that problem. And that is true, you know, on, in a corporate context and from which I come from, you know, helping corporations to develop innovation. Um, but it's also true if you look at how to solve really the global challenges we are facing today. Mm -hmm. And how do you get people in your work, how do you get people who have just <coughs> separate interests to collaborate and share a common goal? Well, the, the number one question we, we always ask um, to start with is to what's the intrinsic motivation for somebody to participate? Because, um, very often these efforts um, start with, well, let's give out a huge price. <laughs> and uh, But that only fosters the external uh, motivation and not the intrinsic one. So the real question really has to be, what does the individual have personally from that collaboration? And that does not have to be a personal benefit. It could also be um, satisfaction of being part of la something larger, of being able to create the future. Um, could be very specific benefits, for example, um, if you have employees collaborating to have better career chances um, or to have suppliers and companies collaborating to be able to establish business relationships. So it's really um, a very individual case of that what that intrinsic motivation could be. Yeah. Um, but that should always be the number one question. That's inter interesting, sort of a... I don't want to say um, um, a, 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 a motherly, uh, uh, womanly view of how to get people to stop fighting and start collaborating. Say, what's, what's your intrinsic motivation? Looking inside. That's very interesting. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if that's tied to gender, but it's. Um, no, I know no, many I, psychologically <laughs> no, uh, theories like, coming from that. Stop fighting, mothers, to telling people stop fighting and get together. You know. Fight, okay. <laughs> Sorry for the bad analogy, but James. No worries. <laughs> in our um, in our conversations leading up to this con- to this uh, conference, you talked about magnifying your efforts, and you talked about the uh, the role of money in in. Um, in, in driving collaboration, getting people sort of bang their heads together because there's a lot of money involved. Could you expound, expand on that a little bit? Is that uh, something you could share some further ideas on? Yeah. Um, I was just listening to Catherine and, and you know, I'm a, I've been a, an entrepreneur for 40 years. And one of the things that I've learned is that, <clears throat> that hope is not a strategy in business. Um, and it's a very human thing, but in terms of being successful in business, if you don't get the job done, um, hope doesn't get you very far. Um, I, I have um, dealt with a rather <clears throat> interesting problem um, over the years, and that is that everything that I do requires cattle to do. Um, and when you're an entrepreneur, by definition, you're not using most of the time your own money. <clears throat> Excuse me. You're using um, other people's money. And that means you have to get the job done or you don't do it again. And I have had a, an excellent track record in, um, over the years. I've never lost any of my investors' money. I made the money. Um, but what I've discovered um, is that collaboration in the world that I operate in, and we have a lawyer here who specializes, I'm sure, in intellectual property. Um, and what happens when you try and do a deal with somebody? Um, and the first time that I talk to somebody in my business about doing something together, I have to overcome issues of trust, of integrity, of what's in it for them, why are they talking to me, uh, what, are they, what do they want to steal from me or take from me. And that's true when you do international business. So I'm, I'm talking to a gentleman in India. I have a call later on today with a senior person in Senegal, West Africa. Um, and all the time that I'm doing this, money is in the background because I'm building a business and I'm trying to sell something or I'm trying to raise money from an investor. Um, and trust, trust is the biggest barrier to that kind of collaboration that I've run into. And we, we have all sorts of formalities involved to try and overcome that. NDAs, for example, um, and contracts and intellectual property and patents and all this sort of stuff. Um, and I don't have to tell anybody here that those are major issues. But the other major issue is when you're trying to innovate, you also have to get people to believe that what you're innovating is worthwhile um, to them, not to the world. That's an impact investor will tell you they're trying to save the world, but they're also trying to make money. Um, and you, if you're innovating, you have to convince somebody that your innovation is worthwhile. Um, and right now, um, I'm, I'm in a wonderful position um, and in the abstract of having developed something that the world really, really needs. It's anybody who hears about it, the first thing they say is, wow, that's amazing, right? But the that does not translate uh, into mana from heaven. It doesn't translate into investors because you have to persuade them that if you're going to do business in Senegal, they can pay for it. Or if you're going to do business in India, they're not going to steal your IP. So those are all issues around collaboration and money that I've encountered in my life. And the only way I know how to deal with that is to be straightforward and try and uh, trust other people as best I can, but don't get, you know, played for the sucker. <laughs> mm-hmm. And Chris, I'm sure you, that's all very familiar stuff to you. It is, James. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, James, could you uh, take over from there and sort of run, run with it? He opened the door and passed the buck to you. So maybe you could talk about trust trust and and uh, and ip and overcoming sort of resistance and maybe you could tie that into well-being and your challenges trying to get uh, a collaborative effort going in in the wellness space yeah yeah look th- th- thank you john um I, i'm not going to touch on on ip but uh, people certainly get sensitive about ip being stolen and not being paid for etc so i'm i'm very familiar with that um, look, so, so, so my great passion, as I mentioned, is is, is mental ill health, and um, w- w- we chatted about this, John, in our in our pre-call, um, because over the years I've struggled with my own 
mental ill health and um, and things around stress and anxiety, uh, leading through to full blown depression on a number of occasions. And um, and I self medicated with alcohol. And the danger is if you self medicate for long enough and in large enough quantities, you uh, can become an alcoholic. I became, I am an alcoholic. Um, thankfully, uh, in recovery, um, but I'm conscious that it's always there and able to grab me. And um, and so I have a very significant interest in this area. The, the thing I would mention about mental health that, that, that gives me some cause for hope is that people genuinely seem to be uh, approaching it in, in, in an open way, at least in terms of how organizations can help. So I now attend and, and talk about mental well-being around the world regularly, and I'm pleased that people are sharing best practice around what companies and organizations can do and what we as individuals can do to look after ourselves better. The piece that's missing is, is around research. That's the really big missing piece. And um, the Wellcome Trust is doing some excellent work on this uh, uh, in conjunction with the World Economic Forum. Um, I sit on the board of a mental health charity called MQ Mental Health Research, which is the leading mental health research charity in, in the UK. And we commission uh, work around, around the world. But we're, we're in the foothills. We're in the lowest of the lowest foothills when it comes to research into mental well-being, which seems extraordinary on the basis that mental well-being is the biggest cause of disability in the world today. Um, and, of course, we haven't even got, you know, and, and that's data from Europe and from America. The, we really haven't got data for much of the world. You look at somewhere like India, there isn't much data there, although I know the incidences of mental ill health are very significant. There isn't much data for Africa, and, and there are many other countries in, in Asia as well where, where data is, is not available. And you'd think, given the significance of the mental health challenge around the world, that we would have the most fantastic incentive to do something about it. And yet there is not. You know, even in the UK, I mean, I, I'm staggered when I look at the numbers. £180 per person is spent on cancer research. Uh, the equivalent on mental health research is £10 per person. So £180 versus £10. And if you then look at the biggest cause of mental ill health, which is depression, uh, it's just £1.55 per person is spent uh, per year on research into depression. So it, there's a significant need. Mental ill health is incredibly common. Uh, and, and yet why isn't there collaboration to try and do something about that? And I can come back in a, a bit later on. I don't want to um, not take up too much of the time. We've got other panellists to speak and things. But it does seem extraordinary to me the size of the, the cause, the, the awfulness of it, 25 million people a year try and commit suicide. Uh, and yet there is so little being done around the world to do stuff in mental well-being, either at an individual level or at a sort of global collaborative level. And I've got some ideas as to why that is. Um, and I certainly would love to hear from the other panelists as to how they think we, we could make a difference in terms of collaboration in this area. So thank you, John. Fascinating. Fascinating numbers. 25 million suicides. Wow. Attempted suicides, John. Attempted, Attempted suicides. suicides. Um, there is thankfully a smaller number who are successful, but, but the very fact that they are trying it is of enormous sadness and concern. No, that probably touches all of our lives. We all know people, our families and friendship circles who are depressed and, and not telling about it. And, uh, and maybe even, you know, some suicides and some self self-inflicted injury and, uh, certainly collaboration would be really important in that in that area. And the other thing is so important in the world is nutrition. And uh, you would think that with nutrition, Mark, being such so fundamental to our, our, our you know, our, our lives and our health and, and living, 
that the world would be collaborating em enormously in that in that area. You're, you, I would have to say you're probably a global expert at being able to roll out the, the nutrition story and the challenges. Um, and uh, so you've traveled all over the place. What's your what's your what's your prognostication and what's what's your recommendation to get people to better collaborate around uh, nutrition? Um, I, I would probably go straight to um, to support the comments that that uh, that James made. Um, it, it, it's trust. It is uh, its behavior. It is building those individual relationships to start with, because the problem now, I, my first overseas trip in 2015, I went to um, to the nutrition conference in Sao Paulo in Brazil. Um, never been to Brazil before. Um, thought it was one of the most depressing places I've ever been. If you've never been to Sao Paulo, it's extraordinary. A concrete metropolis, um, uh, too dangerous to walk on the streets. Um, and then the, the lectures on the nutrition component started and they told me they were graduating 5,000 young nutritionists a year um, because to keep up with the level of public health problem, 15% of adults in Brazil had type 2 diabetes. Now, if, if that was a percentage in the United Kingdom, that would be a, a, a catastrophe of, of, of an undescribable magnitude. Um, but they just accepted it in Brazil, and, and it was down to a Western diet and influences and many other factors. And, and then I started to look at the other numbers as a move around the world. You come away from that overwhelmed. How on earth could you possibly help a country like that? And then you know, the, I've made some notes, like others, you know, the two billion people now in the world are overweight or obese. Two billion people have got a vitamin or a mineral uh, uh, nutrition deficiency. 73% of deaths are caused by non-communicative diseases. Um, smoking, high blood pressure, um, high body mass index, high glucose. Those are all contributory factors to over half of those deaths. You can just literally become overwhelmed and think, what can I as an individual do? So in those moments of, of complexity and chaos... Um, I go back to my battlefield training. What did we used to do? And you would find a way of isolating yourself, even for a few seconds or a few minutes, um, and take a fresh perspective if you can and start. How, how could I get out of this problem by starting again? And how would you start to collaborate if collaboration didn't exist? You would start with what James was saying, that one-to-one -one relationship built on trust. And we keep coming back to that being about people's character. And it might sound old fashioned and traditionalist to talk about um, um, you know, honor and duty and, and character, but those are timeless qualities that have, um, that have served the test of time. And why would we not go back to those or reinvigorate those to start again? So, um, I, I'm not, I don't have many solutions to those problems. I could, I could get scientists to talk about biofortification. There's been some really good success stories in nutrition, um, particularly in solving the malnutrition problem. But you know, malnutrition still exists in an obese world, and that is extraordinary. Uh, just that statement alone is, is incredibly complex. The good thing, I think, in, in summing up for me, what I see as a non-scientist, as I travel extensively around the world, I see scientific collaboration. Science knows no borders or boundaries, as what we say. And when the UK left the European Union in 2016, and the first thing we did here in London was organise a conference in Ireland and in Georgia um, and in France next year, we ignored the fact that we're not in the European Union. We still see ourselves as an international body and, and collaborate across the world. And scientists, I think, are very good at that. Mm -hmm. Non-scientists looking in and joining this sector um, I was really quite overwhelmed by that capacity to collaborate. Um, does it exist in other fields? I'm not an expert on that. I'd like to think it's hit, exists in politics. No. And back to values and trust and character again, which might not be quite so prevalent in our political leaders as we would like to see. Can I jump in there, Mark? Is that all right, John? Mm. Yeah, look, um, the, the, I, I agree that uh, scientists um, may well hold the answers to a number of the things that we've been talking about, 
part of the challenge, though, is is um, getting funding for those scientists. And whilst um, some excellent work is happening in the sphere of mental well-being, and clearly in your case in in nutrition. Funding is is very, very problematic. And if you're in an area of science which shows significant change as a result of that research, it's easy. So cancer is probably one of the best examples because, you know, the, the, the world of science has done extraordinary things to help um, deal with uh, cancer, uh, uh, not completely, but but significantly. The challenge with 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 mental health is is that it takes enormous amounts of time for the research to be done. It's very slow being able to indicate what the outcomes might be, and therefore, as a result, including with stigma, it's very difficult to get funding. So, if you're a super clever scientist, what you're not going to do is to do research into mental well-being because you're not going to get uh, any funding. And and so that's part of the problem, certainly in the area that I'm interested in. Uh, In nutrition, is there funding available extensively there? Uh, I think most scientists would say there's never enough funding. Um, And most of the successful funding, interestingly, from my perspective, often comes from collaborations. You will get funding if two or three agencies, two or three national bodies have come together, which is one of the challenges of leaving the European Union, that there was significant uh, cross-nation funding going on there. Um, But we're not seeing an an immediate uh, dip in that. The next few years are going to be very interesting because the government has plugged that hole for the short term. Where will that future collaboration come from? Um, And from a publishing point of view, we make most of our revenue for our society from publishing the the research in scientific journals. Um, We we're chasing where the research money is to publish. And that seems to be emerging in India and China. Um, Those are the big pockets of research at the moment. So I'm assuming people will will go there for research. But as you said, um, there's very little data on mental health issues in India in particular. I wonder wonder if I can jump in. Uh, I think I'm looking at the the, the faces on the screen. I think I'm the oldest guy in the room here by landslide. Um, (laughs) John, you're a youngster. (laughs) Uh, I had had dinner last week with a 94-year-old friend of mine from years and years and years ago. Um, I, um, so I have a sort of more philosophical view of this. Um, first of all, um, you know, innovation happens and things happen because the market people are looking for it. They need it. They want it, right? So everybody's now, you know, spending a lot of money, and there are a lot of companies that made a lot of money selling um, alcohol in a bottle, calling it hand purifier, hand scrubbing. We've all been told to scrub our hands because of the COVID epidemic. Well, that that little innovation was discovered in the, around 1780 in Vienna, that if you washed your hands, you stopped infection, right? Well, that was 200 years ago. And it wasn't until the COVID epidemic that businesses sprang up and started to manufacture this stuff so people would do that. Now we're all compulsively washing our hands. Well, that wasn't about science. That had nothing to do with science and everything to do with human need. So when we're talking about mental wellness, okay, back in the 19, late 1970s, I started a company, and we, we tried to figure out, if we're helping people figure out what their health risks were, what was the status of their mental health? And there wasn't a single psychological instrument that existed that allowed you to assess your mental health. You could find out whether you were cuckoo, but you couldn't find out whether you were healthy, right? Um, And so we did a lot of work in that area, um, Chris. Um, One of the things that that is so important are longitudinal studies, long studies. And there was a psychiatrist at Harvard called Grant um, who did a, uh, who started a study um, that's been continued until today of Mm. the, of the, of the class of 1947 at Harvard. Yeah, I've read it. Fascinating. 
Yeah, and it's a fascinating study. And it, yeah. it, what it does is it, it looks at these people over their entire lifetime and says, what were the things that contributed to their mental health? Okay, and the, the first thing that turned up out of that was that mental health was an illusion. And every one of us in our own lives knows that's true. We've all had a lot of bad stuff in our life. We've had kids that have gone wrong. We've had parents that have gone whatever. We all have had personal trouble in our life. So mental mental health, according to this study, is not whether you are, you are free from these things, but how you deal with them, how you deal with them. And, Chris, you had a, a problem. You dealt with it. Uh, and that's a testament to your mental health, even though you might have thought you, had a, you were not your ability to, to cope with it and deal with it. Some people can't cope with it and they take, they go out the window. Um, I ran, in, this is interesting. I ran into a man in New York last week who was sitting in a coffee shop and he was there every day. And I finally figured out who he was and he was a, a, a massively successful private equity investor who jumped out of an eighth story window of his apartment house 10 years ago because somebody told him to get rid of his dog in the apartment house. And he survived a jump of eight floors, and there he is drinking coffee every day in New York City. So how we cope with life um, is interesting. Now, the other thing I'd like to say is we talk about nutrition, and my reaction to that is, come on, we're not talking about nutrition. We're talking about massive food insecurity around the world. Starvation. This is not about do I eat donuts or McDonald's or, you know, Mazzola oil. This is, do I have anything to eat at all? Um, and for me, the, the, the issue of food insecurity is not about science. It's about collaboration between governments, right? Yeah. So if the U.S. has an, a food policy which starves people in Africa, we can't research our way out of that. So this is why I had a little frustration about this group, this, this topic. Because how are five individuals sitting around talking for an hour are going to change food insecurity? Or as you put it, mental health, mental well-being. Or the lack of funding for X, Y, or Z. For my case, it's funding for innovation. Um, in everybody's case, we, we, have, we lack funding for this out of the other thing. And, it's, and it varies from country to country. So that's my sort of reaction to all of that. My twist from an old guy. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think the fact is that we're we have that we just we live in the real world on this planet. We have to eat and clothe ourselves, and uh, and it's like necessity is the mother of invention. And I'm reminded of a of a comment that uh, Katharina made on our on our pre calls, and she said, "Why did it take uh, a pandemic for us to start to really collaborate on a global basis or climate change?" So I thought that was pretty prescient, um, Katharina. Maybe you could talk about why, what it takes for us to start collaborating. <laughs> Hopefully not another pandemic. <laughs> um, yeah, what we've seen in the last year and a half is that really um, in order to tackle, um, to, to find problems, for, uh, to find solutions to, to the pandemic, um, people have teamed up in, in many different ways. So, for example, in Germany, we had quite many hackathons. Um, in order to find, uh, for example, digital solutions for digital education. Um, there were, uh, for example, the one challenge that was called um, Give a Breath Challenge, where the Munich Re and Fraunhofer, they teamed up to find um, 3D printable ventilation devices um, throughout the world. And even up to, you know, the vaccination um, that uh, has been, that all that I've seen at least, um, that that are out there, were collaborations between several companies. And um, so I think the, what the pandation, pan, pandemic really has taught us is that if there is a pressing and global and huge problem, that it's easier to tackle it in collaboration and um, in and joining forces with others who might have the relevant uh, knowledge. And, and it really comes from the observation that not no single person or single organization can really have the complex knowledge needed to solve these problems. Um, <clears throat> and even if you look at not as large issues, but let's say as a general also corporate perspective, for example, to develop a um, humanoid uh, 
ro robot, you know, you need um, knowledge around software and hardware, you need knowledge around how people speak and move and behave and interaction and, um, and you need to bring the people with all the different skills together. So, uh, but, but your question of what does it need to actually do that, to bring them together, that is again for me a very, very emotional one, you know, in, in the case of the, the robot, <laughs> let's keep it simple. Um, it's, it's really people who, uh, want to, want to see that what they know and, and what they're able to contribute in there, um, that they're able to provide kind of sense with that to, um, to solve issues and that they're able to have a significant contribution. And I think this is really uh, on a human level, you know, also connecting to the other speakers in terms of mental health. This is really something that, um, we as humans strive for, you know, we want to, matter we want to make a difference we want to do something that really um is significant and, and um and makes sense you know and that could be on a very personal individual level what what that type of purpose is but uh really in order to bring people together for innovation that has to be the core question you know what's common purpose of such a project and how do you get people to contribute their individual skills ideas and knowledge um to to drive that purpose so, so you, you, you just you just said something which is my the thing that I focus on. You just said, "How do you get people to collaborate?" You just said that, all right. Um, and, and I think one of the elephants in the room is is social media and the internet. Here we are, five people all over the world talking to each other. We couldn't have done that fifteen years ago, and we're going to be doing it much, much more in the future. But the big question, and I don't have an answer to it, is how do you get people to collaborate? I, I've been trying all my life. It's very, very, very hard. And, you know, don't forget Darwin. You know, try to get a bunch of chicks in a chicken coop to collaborate. They don't. They fight for the food, right? And right now, with global warming, food insecurity, pandemics, you begin to see the breakdown of collaboration. You see collaboration and development of a vaccine, but you also see the United States and China throwing spears at each other about wh where, the, that, where the, the pandemic started. You're seeing all kinds of, of quote unquote, pandemic diplomacy, vaccine diplomacy, which is not about collaboration. It's about improving your position in the world. So I don't know the answer. I, I don't have the answer. I just know that it's, it's um, the world is moving very quickly and problems are coming every day. And I don't I don't see us dealing with migration or food insecurity or mental health anytime soon by people talking about it. <laughs> so I, 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 jump promise, in there, I promise, I promised uh, Frank that we would end on time. We've got two minutes left and I, I'd like to call on Chris because in our uh, private uh, prep call, uh, pre-call, we had a, we, we had a several calls. Chris shared the most amazing story to me about his objective and goal to you mentioned media to bring attraction, bring attention to a problem. And he did that using a long bike <clears throat> ride. Could you talk about that for a minute, Chris, and then we'll all sign off. All right. That's very sweet, John. So, so j just very briefly. So I, I um, overall, I've been very fortunate in life, despite some of my, my challenges around depression and alcoholism, etc. And I thought it was right, given my focus on India, to do some, um, some big charitable events. And um, so, so there are two in particular. The first one was in 2015, where I marked my 30th anniversary at my firm by walking slash running 30 marathons in 30 days from Mumbai to Bangalore. So down the, the beautiful west coast of India through Maharashtra, Goa. Uh, and when I got to Mangalore in Karnataka, I turned left and went over the Western Ghats into, into Bangalore. I have to say that was, I was very, very close to not being able to do that. And then last year, so the last time I was in India, I was on my bicycle and I was in Kashmir because I had cycled from Kanyakumari, which is the very southernmost tip of India, to uh, the, the northernmost tip uh, in Kashmir. And um, so that was um, 4,100 kilometers in 41 days. So I did 100 kilometers a day on my bike. And in, on both of those occasions, I was able to raise $300,000 uh, for widows uh, and their children in India. So I, I guess... 
your your theme, John, and what what you're encouraging me to say is is that actually we can make a difference, and we can ask people to join us uh, in trying to meet at least some of the needs, uh, even though we're only little human beings and one of whatever it is, eight billion people, we can make a difference. So and you've you. also documented the fact that extreme exercise is terrific for your mental health. It's the it best. Is. It is indeed. <laughs> it is indeed. Well, that sort of reminds me. I mean, it's, so it's the collective, uh, the collectivism of all of us doing our part, almost like a centipede with a thousand legs walking, walking forward. Um, and each of us tackling different parts of the problems that are, nobody's going to solve all the problems and use collaboration to solve all the problems, but each in our own way, we're going to contribute to the innovative solutions that are going to create uh, collaborative uh, collaborative solutions for the for the world. What you did is almost like Mahatma Gandhi, you know, using using uh, you know, one, what can one man accomplish, uh, one woman or one man accomplish to really have a big impact. So, um, fantastic su- session. Uh, I look forward to keeping in touch with all of you, each of you and collaborating somehow. Well, John, uh, thank you for putting this together. And in the spirit of collaboration, I encourage any of you to ask me to to help you in whatever you're doing. And if I can, I will. Thank you very much. And thanks to Frank for putting this together. Okay, That's great. All right. Thank you. Be well. Bye. Cheers, Cheers, everybody. Thank you. Stay healthy. Stay well fed.